Welcome again to today's webinar, Improve Your Organization's Information Security Controls with the new ISO 27002-2022 standard. My name is Aprajada Singh from BSI Marketing Team, and I am here to facilitate this webinar. Before we start, I would like to give you some ground rules. You have joined this webinar as listen-only mode, but please feel free to type in your questions in the question box on the webinar control panel. Our speakers will do their best to answer as many questions at the end of the webinar. If due to the time limit, your questions are not being answered, then we will provide them after this webinar. This session is being recorded and will be shared with you shortly after. Our speakers for today's webinar are Mr. Dheerit Saxena and Mr. Ravindra Narayanappa. Thank you both for joining us here today. Mr. Dheerit Saxena, the General Manager at Learning and Development at BSI India, he specializes in service management, information security, privacy, business continuity management, risk management, and corporate integrity management for the IT sector. His total experience exceeds 28 years, out of which 18 years were invested in the IT-enabled service, services industry, comprising of service delivery, governance, risk, and compliance and project management. Our second speaker is Mr. Ravendra Narayanappa, who has a work experience of 36 years, including 22 years in information technology and IT infrastructure management organizations such as Hindustan Motors, Tektronix uh, India, and Tata Alexi, followed by 15, in, 15 years in training and auditing of management systems at BSI. He is the trainer and lead auditor for information security management, IT service management, quality management, business continuity management, records management, privacy information management, risk management, and CSS star certification compliance assessment of HIPAA and TIA 9421. We will start this webinar with our first speaker now, Mr. Dheerat Saxena, over to you. Thanks so much, Aparadita, and uh, welcome everyone. Very good afternoon to everyone. So in the next 45 minutes, uh, we are going to take you through the following. We will walk you through the overall uh, concept of the new version of the standard, its relevance to the industry and how it applies to organizations. We will definitely cover the broad control structure of various controls in this standard. We'll talk about some new controls between me and Ravindra, and we'll also talk about some uh, additions or modifications made, it, made to the existing controls. So let's get started. So if you remember, the whole concept of the 27002 standard was that it's a collection of best practices and best practices in terms of managing the risks to information security. And when we talk about risks, you have the word called control, which is a countermeasure to a risk. So the control is a measure which modifies or reduces risks or maybe maintain its level at the existing uh, level which you want. So countermeasure to a risk is the key word behind the word control here. If you look at the title of the standard, it talks about two additional things in addition to information security. It talks about cyber security, which was not there in the previous version, and it talks about privacy as well. I'm still focusing on the, uh, the title of the standard. Having said that, now let's give you an overview of the nature of this standard. All these so-called controls or countermeasures are generic in nature. They are intended to be applicable to all organizations, irrespective of the nature of business or the size of the organization. And the best part is that these controls can be tweaked to the risks that you are facing in your organization. So you decide how to implement the control. Okay, uh, these are guidelines which are given by the ISO. Another aspect of selecting these controls is that they are tightly linked with the risks the organization faces. So for example, 
uh, if you are uh, an outsource organization, you heavily outsource your core processes, then uh, the risk of uh, vendor uh, continuity is applicable to you and maybe the control applicable is a lot of due diligence for the suppliers before you onboard them. So the point is you will select the controls based on the risks applicable to your organization. The second aspect here is that once you select the controls from 27002 and decide that you will implement them, then you develop specific standard operating procedures or guidelines for actually deciding who will implement which control, what will be the procedure, who will be responsible, what will be the key, key performance indicators, how will you measure the effectiveness of the control. All that is left to the organization to decide. And the third aspect, as I mentioned, is these controls are tightly linked to the ISO 27001 standard. So these two standards go hand in hand. Basically, the requirements for information security given in 27001 can be met by choosing and implementing and monitoring and improving the controls which are there in 27002. So that's the linkage between the two. At this point, I want to ask you a question that, and maybe you can answer this question in the chat box, just by simply typing yes or no. So the question is as follows. Are the controls which you select, are they dependent on your organization's objectives and risk profile? That's the question. Answer yes or no in the chat box, please. Thank you. We'll just give it 10 seconds. The question is, the controls which you select, are they dependent on your organization's objectives and risk profile? Yes or no? Okay, so we're getting some responses. Okay, so the answer is yes, definitely there's a tight linkage between the controls that you select based on what your organization's prerogatives are. So for example, if you are an organization which is bound by data protection laws, then you are bound to have controls related to privacy and you select them accordingly from the 27002 standard. Let's move on to the major clauses in the standard. So there are four major clauses. If you look at the structure of the standard, Clause one talks about introduction, then scope, then you have normative references, and then finally terms and definitions. And then you have clause five, which talks about organizational level controls related to organization wide applications. So these are related to governance mainly. You have around 37 odd controls, out of which three are new and 34 are existing. Uh, these are organization-wide controls or administrative controls primarily. For example, I mentioned vendor due diligence, for example, organization-level information security policy, for example, access control. These are all organization-level controls in Clause 5. Then we go to the next clause, which is Clause 6. Now, here, for those who remember the previous version of 27002, which was released in 2013, there were some people related controls in A.7 and all those are existing right now in clause 6. So for example, uh, background screening, roles and responsibilities related to uh, information security and so on and so forth, awareness and training. These are people related controls which are there in clause 6. When you look at clause 7, these are the physical controls and uh, one new control has been added here. Now, physical controls, for example, perimeter security, working in special areas, uh, physical access control, and so on and so forth, or reconciliation of access rights. So these are the physical controls that we have in Clause 7. And then we have the last clause, which is Clause 8, and this has got major modifications. Now, Clause 8 is a group of technical controls. And you have seven new controls, and we are going to walk you through these controls, uh, the new ones. 
So you have 34 controls in all in Clause 8, out of which seven are new. So this is the overall, uh, you can say, clause structure of the new standard. Having said that, my question to all of you is, and if you again can use the chat box to answer yes or no, can your organization implement additional controls apart from those given in 27002? Yes or no? Would you like to answer? Can you have additional controls? Yes or no? So we're waiting for the response in the chat box from participants. Let's have some responses, please. So the answer is definitely yes. You can have additional controls selected outside of 27002 based on the unique risks that you are facing in your organization. You can design your own controls. You can have some controls selected from other frameworks. So for example, if you are in the medical industry and you are serving clients in the US, you may want to select some controls from the HIPAA framework. Similarly, you can select some controls from NIST framework and so on and so forth. So the answer is yes, you can uh, select a lot of additional controls and design new ones as well. It's up to the organization to decide which controls to select from 27002 and which not to select. Let's have a look into the attributes or properties of each control and I'll sum it up with an example on the next slide as well. So let's go through these five attributes. The first one says control type. What kind of a control is it? Is it preventive? That means does it tend to avoid the risk from materializing or is it detective? That means it will be able to detect the occurrence of a security incident or is it corrective? That means after the security incident has happened, then can we uh, perform remedial action through this control? So these are the, uh, you can say, sub attribute or attribute values of the first attribute, which is control type. Let's look at the second attribute, information security property. Here, the objective is to address the properties of information security, whether the control is addressing only confidentiality, which is basically ensuring that only authorized people have access, or is it uh, addressing integrity also of information? That means accuracy and completeness of information, or is it addressing availability as well? That means whether the information is available on demand to the people who are authorized or not. Then let's look at the third attribute, which is cyber security concepts. As you know, this standard has put additional uh, focus on cyber security and privacy, and that's why they have these attribute values throughout the cyber security life cycle. So does the control identify the risks or help uh, define the approach of how to manage the cyber security risks, or does it protect? That means does it ensure uh, service delivery, smooth service delivery, how does it do that? Or does it help to detect a cyber security incident and respond to it? And then once you have responded, how do you restore back to normalcy? Can it help us in that also? That's the third attribute value. Then you have operational capabilities. So uh, these are some, for example, around 15 of them. And they talk about asset management, application security, network security, business continuity, vulnerability management, and so on and so forth, and supplier relationships also. Basically, what these attribute values are helping an organization is to filter out the controls and categorize them and inform the management what kind of controls they have. So for example, if you are reporting to the management on the information security posture, you might be able to tell them how many preventive controls do we have? How many controls are there with us which can help us to identify the issue before it occurs? Or how many controls do we have around supply relationships? And so on and so forth. So, and, and if you look at the last control attribute, which is security domains, it gives us the themes uh, which are applicable across the board. So for example, you have governance and ecosystem controls, like your information security policy. Then you have protection controls like 
uh, anti-malware, etc., or protection controls, and you have resilience controls such as business continuity controls. So basically, the idea is that these attributes help to analyze what type of controls you have, and the organization is not bound by these attribute values. You can uh, choose to have your own attribute values altogether. So that's the flexibility. So here in this slide, we're just demonstrating the applicability of these attributes for you. We've taken one control as an example, which is the most fundamental control, policies for information security. That's the first control. There are total 93 controls. So this is the first one, which is 5.1, policies for information security. So let's go through each of the attribute values. It's a preventive control. Why? Because information security policy is meant to set the expectations around information security objectives, information uh, security approach to risk management and governance. So tends to prevent uh, issues by telling the people that this is what we want from you. If you look at the information security properties, a policy of information security is addressing all three aspects of information security, whether it is confidentiality, or integrity or availability. If you move towards the right side, cybersecurity concepts helps you to identify the risk management approach for uh, various types of cybersecurity risks as well. And then if you look at operational capabilities, primarily a policy is around governance or control of the entire information security management system. And if you look at the security domains or themes, Again, it says governance and ecosystem as well as resilience. Resilience means the, the power to bounce back, right? So this is how they've designed these attributes for the first control. Apart from these attributes, you have other elements which have been expressed in the 27002. So they are, you'll have a control title. That means the, it starts with a title. For this one, it's policies for information security. Then you have the purpose, which was earlier called the control objective. Then you have guidance on how this control can be implemented and other supplementary information as well. So that's the way controls have been listed here. Now let's come on to the new controls. So there are 11 of them. There are total 93 controls. And the good news is that they've merged a few controls, they have modified some controls, and uh, they have reduced from 114 to 93 controls. If you look at this list, uh, it tells you there is some amount of uh, emphasis on cybersecurity in terms of threat intelligence, in terms of information security for cloud services, in terms of ICT readiness for business continuity. And I'll just touch upon these controls. We'll go deeper into all three of them in a short while. And then I'll request my colleague Ravindra to touch upon the other ones, which is configuration management, data masking, data leakage prevention, all related to technical controls, and then monitoring activities, web filtering, and secure coding as well. We'll talk about some of them in the subsequent slides. So let's go into these controls. The first one, threat intelligence. Now, if you look at the control type and the cybersecurity concepts, it's indicating that it's applicable throughout the cybersecurity lifecycle. That means A, it helps in preventing the incident. B, if the incident happens somehow, helps to detect it and then uh, helps you in taking remedial actions also because it's corrective in nature as well. And if you look at the cybersecurity concepts, again, it's going through the entire cybersecurity lifecycle right from in identifying to detecting and responding to it also. So there's a life cycle approach here in this control. It's integrated with risk management. And as soon as you apply this control and start monitoring and reporting this control, and if you discover some vulnerabilities, then it helps you to adapt accordingly as well. So <clears throat> the control talks about a layered model. Now, what it means is that cybersecurity threat intelligence has to be across strategic, tactical and operational levels. So at the strategic level, uh, one needs to gather uh, intelligence in terms of the broad level of risks for the entire organization. 
and the vulnerabilities around them. Then uh, at the tactical level, what are the uh, departments, etc., business units which are going to be affected, how we are going to manage this, and at the operational level, what are the roles and responsibilities of people involved, what exactly will be done in, in terms of implementing the procedure for this control, all three layers are covered. The standard also uh, uh, specifies that whatever intelligence is gathered has to be contextual for the organization. That means it should help the organization take action depending on its own circumstances. And then once you know what these uh, uh, risks are, then it helps you to either formulate new controls or modify your existing controls. And then on an ongoing basis, the organization is expected to report on the effectiveness of threat intelligence and what kind of consultation has been done with various experts and how the control has been adapted or what are the learnings over time. So that's a quick brief on threat intelligence, which is a new control in clause five. Now let's look at another one, which is a new control information security for use of quality cloud services so if you look at the attributes again it's a preventive control that means before even you enter into a cloud uh, services agreement with someone what kind of due diligence would you like to do what terms and conditions would you like to have in your uh, agreement with the cloud service provider what are the risks to you if you enter in a cloud, what kind of information would you like to put in the cloud and what kind of information would you not like to put in a cloud? All these aspects make this control a preventive control in nature. And obviously, if you move towards the right, it's going to address all three properties of information security in terms of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It's meant to protect from a cybersecurity perspective uh it's it's meant to protect and uh, it, it's a proactive kind of a control in terms of operational capabilities it helps you to set the expectations with your cloud supplier and helps you to manage the relationship on an ongoing basis with the cloud supplier so that means on an ongoing basis reviews of cloud security supplier are also needed under this control and again uh, if you look at the security domain at the right uh, side of the table it helps you to govern the supplier performance so it's up to the organization what kind of uh, standards to expect from the cloud service provider in terms of the shared architecture what kind of sensitive personal information to share with the clouds what kind of jurisdiction uh, should the servers be in as per the laws and regulation related to privacy? Will the uh, cloud service provider share reports on an ongoing basis with your organization also? How will they manage incidents? What will be the escalation mechanism? What information will be shared and within how much time? And then are they going to subcontract? Is your cloud service provider going to subcontract with another provider? If yes, will they inform you or not? What are the terms and conditions and then if you want to exit how will they securely dispose of your information how will they return your secure information all those uh, aspects should be preferably there in your agreement with your cloud service provider so identify all the cloud service related risks and requirements come out with policies so you need to have a cloud service policy uh, in your organization, which is acknowledged by your cloud service provider also. Then uh, how will the uh, processes like change management happen? So if you are making changes in your infrastructure, how is the cloud service provider going to ensure that the change is smooth without disrupting your service? How are incidents going to be reported and managed in terms of priority? And if you want to augment your capacity of the infrastructure, then what is the mechanism to do that? All these aspects need to be considered under this control. So let's look at the poll question. And uh, this is where I'll, I'll request my colleague to open the poll. Let me first read the question here. So 
the question says, which of the following cloud security risks are applicable to your organization? We put three risks in the first three bullet points. The first one is, the risk says organization, which is your organization has reduced visibility and control if you outsource to a cloud service provider. Is that applicable to you? The second one says separation between multiple tenants may fail. That means, as you know, cloud infrastructure is shared and virtually shared. So if the hardware fails, will your information be compromised with other tenants? That's another risk which may materialize. Is it applicable to you or not? And the third one says inadequate personal data protection. So choose your answer. And the last one is none of the above. That means if you have not outsourced to cloud service provider, then none of these risks are applicable to you. So let's take another 15 seconds before closing the poll, please. And then we'll publish the results of the poll. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I think uh, majority of the uh, people have said that either one of these risks is applicable to their organization. So for example, uh, around 78% have chosen that either the organization has reduced visibility of control or the, the separation between multiple tenants which may fail and inadequate personal data protection. That means most of the organizations here have already got a cloud service provider, right? Okay. Thanks so much. So let's move on to the next one. Here, we're talking about another new control, which is ICT readiness for business continuity. Now, although you may say that business continuity is a very proactive uh, measure and the control type should have been preventive as well, but the way ISO sees it, that business continuity starts after the disruption happens and hence these controls get actually implemented as a corrective type of control. And they are largely focused on restoring the availability of the service. And that's why instead of putting confidentiality and integrity, they put availability here only. In terms of cybersecurity concepts, obviously the business continuity arrangements which you have will help you to respond to the incident and mitigate the impact of the incident. In terms of operational capabilities, continuity. And in terms of security themes, it talks about resilience or the ability to bounce back after a crisis situation. That's an overview of the control attributes. Then if you go deeper into this control, you'll find that it talks about uh, business impact analysis being done. And as a result of the business impact analysis, you arrive uh, the recovery time objective, that means how soon you're going to revive the services or resume the services. You talk about RPO or recovery point objective, that means how much amount of data has to be restored uh, before you resume the service. It talks about risk assessment also as an input to this control so that you are able to uh, effectively treat the risks to business continuity on a proactive basis. So for example, if there's a risk that you are in a contact center environment and you are running a voice process, and obviously uh, it takes a while before you can shift from the primary facility to the secondary facility. So how do you mitigate that risk? You may want to have parallel operations from two sites so that even if one site fails, you can transfer the volume of calls to the second site on the fly and maybe you can meet a uh, recovery time objective of even two hours if you do this kind of a solution. So business continuity plans need to be made under this control. How you're going to manage the change uh, from business as usual to uh, business continuity situation, that should be addressed in the BC plans in terms of who will do what, what are their roles and responsibility, so what kind of communication will be exchanged, how will you manage, how much capacity will be available during a crisis situation? Obviously, you may not be able to deliver to 100% capacity. So how much capacity would you like to provide during a crisis situation? And then how will you restore to normalcy? 
And then how do you validate the effectiveness of this control? You will do some simulation tests, maybe twice a year. You will monitor those tests. Have they gone well or not? Where were the gaps which occurred? What were the learnings? And maybe if there are too many changes happening in the infrastructure, as soon as a major change happens, again, you might want to do a simulation test to see whether the change will impact business continuity or not. So it's a whole PDCA plan to check act for this control. And these are some new, uh, sorry, not new, but some of the updated controls. Now, if you look at the uh, matrix here, if you look at the columns having black font, they are the controls in the previous version. The ones in the red font are the controls in the new version, right? So we have given you a mapping here between the new and the previous controls, right? Now, some of those controls which I'm picking up here, just to give you an overview. So for example, 5.16 is an updated control, which was earlier 9.2.1 in the form of user registration and deregistration. Now it's called identity management. And obviously there are some additional focus areas in terms of uh, uh, how will you validate the authenticity or maybe if you are using external identities such as if you want to log in using your Google identity how much trust to be allocated to those external mechanisms these points have been added there then uh, you have another one which is use of privileged utility programs again this is now 8.18 previously it was 9.4.4 and they have added some more aspects uh, to those kind of uh, programs which are running like anti-malware programs which are meant as utilities but have privileged access. So who all should have access, how it has to be managed. Then 5.28, uh, it was there in A.16 earlier, 16.1.7. It talks about what kind of evidence to be collected at what point of time if there is an incident which occurs, right? And, and then how to learn and adapt from that evidence in the shortest possible time. Then privacy and protection of personally identifiable information, 5.34. Uh, earlier it was briefly touched in terms of A.18 domain. And now they have put more aspects in terms of data masking, etc., which my colleague Ravindra will cover in a short while from now. So let's have another poll question. And the question is like this, what's your opinion about the controls which we have discussed so far? And I'll read out the options for you. The first option, you have to select only one of them. Are all these controls applicable to all organizations irrespective of product or service? Or relevance of these controls depends on the nature and extent of the risk which your organization is facing? Or you do not know. Kindly choose one of these. Let's keep it open for 15 seconds. Okay, let's close the poll and see. So I think uh, People have got a good uh, understanding of these controls and they are selecting the correct option, which is the middle one. That means relevance of these controls depends on the nature of the risk. That's the correct answer. So I congratulate you for that. Uh, these controls may be applicable. It's not that they are applicable. It depends on the nature of the risks to the organization, whether a control is applicable or not. So the first option is not correct. The second option is correct. Let's move on. And now I'll request my colleague Ravindra to take over. Ravindra, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Jiraj. And uh, well, there are seven new uh, controls under uh, technology controls. Uh, these controls uh, have been implemented uh, based on the past experience with reference to cyber threats. Uh, we had information security incidents. Uh, within the organization, they found that uh, these areas were not very well uh, uh, addressed in the risk assessment, though they were implied in the previous uh, standard. 
now it is explicit for the organizations to demonstrate controls in these uh, area well each of the control uh, most of you may be aware uh, however if i due to interest of our time i'll just take uh, three controls as a sample so that you will have a feel of how these controls are implemented uh, within the uh, organization okay configuration management uh, those who are familiar with uh, iso 20000 service management system uh, they are familiar about this uh, word configuration management where all configurable items are maintained uh, inventory is maintained with a uh, relationship between the ci and uh, inventory uh, is verified often and the objective is to ensure inventory is always up to date and accuracy of the inventory whereas in this uh, standard of iso 27002 the focus is on security configuration of hardware software services and networks that would be the focus and uh, in order to facilitate the standard advises you to have a standard template for example if you want to configure a, a firewall have a standard template in terms of what rules have to be implemented how the ports within the firewall are, are open what process to be used how to be manage these uh, configuration you know have some template so that the security controls of these devices are not overlooked and uh, I'll maintain a database of all those uh, configurations what you have maintained and uh, from time to time you need to monitor the controls whether they are effective or not okay i have implemented a firewall rule uh, for a particular period it has to be deactivated a port was opened for a particular uh, period it has to be deactivated monitor monitor the controls so that they are effective at all times and of course we have the asset management uh, as previously this would be linked with the uh, asset management for inventory inventory accuracy depreciation and other aspects the focus of uh, the configuration management would be of security of configurable items responsibility authority of a maker checker all uh, needs to be well defined and uh, consider the level of protection you need the audit of here the audit is not audit of just an inventory audit of security controls is what is uh, required a change record and logs are to be maintained to ensure that there are no unauthorized uh, changes unintended changes of uh, the hardware software services or networks data masking the objective of this uh, control is to limit the exposure of personally identifiable information especially the sensitive data sensitive data and this control is uh, directly linked with uh, uh, privacy act of uh, various countries in india also personal data protection act is coming up so this control is also more applicable there and uh, here the organization can use various kind of uh, data masking techniques to hide personal information or discuss the identity of the uh, personal information belonging to a data subject or a PII principle. While we implement these controls, you have to look into the local legal regulatory requirements. Contractual requirements should be considered while uh, implementing the while implementing these uh, uh, techniques and while when the when the control is uh, implemented of course uh, you need to always uh, monitor once it is uh, uh, implemented and there has to be a policy within the organization about data masking to be applied considering legal regulatory and contractual requirement yes secure coding secure coding objective is to reduce information security vulnerabilities on application this is the uh, a proactive control right so 
and this uh, control is something we expect an organization to have a minimum baseline or a good governance in place to ensure secure software development and uh, <clears throat> ensure that uh, the role based access is available to the uh, application coding at uh, various levels of software development life cycle this includes the third party softwares as well as uh, open uh, open source uh, software also so there also you need to ensure that uh, the sufficient control is maintained and it should cover the entire software development life cycle not at uh, one or two particular uh, stage and well the objective is to ensure that again applications are secure safe uh, for for its uh, usage and uh, also preventive in terms of uh, the current fast changing threat landscape which we see nowadays uh, where the applications are being compromised customer data are being stolen personal information is being stolen right so in order to prevent this uh, this uh, code uh, this control has been put in place with the new standard yeah of course our training and awareness always uh, is a something required for all the controls here it is all the more important to ensure people involved in secure coding to ensure controls are implemented at all levels uh secure <clears throat> here the uh, secure coding uh, is to have the controls in place where the software development uh, is secure in uh, all respects and uh, especially with reference to the security uh, vulnerability it also uh, takes care of uh, enhancements patching third party softwares and uh, open source uh, softwares uh, should be uh, taken into account and it should be kept up to date you need to you need to uh, refer to the other control called threat intelligence where you get to know the threats from the real world and uh, ensure proactively the controls are implemented though it has not happened to you but you take note of them and then implement the controls that's where threat intelligence uh, helps you to know the real world software uh, threats and the uh, whole software development cycle life cycle from the beginning to be taken care right from the requirement gathering to analysis design testing deploying throughout the life cycle the information security controls needs to be in place yeah so i have a, a poll question uh, here and the question is is about do you think the new and modified controls will help your organization to improve the security posture select one of the one of the option yes maybe if our management agrees yeah, some management may not agree so you may have to live with the residual risk uh, no it does not make any you, you feel it doesn't make any difference uh, so let me know from you in next uh, 15 seconds yeah good uh yeah, good reply i can see that uh, it uh, enhances and that's one of the objective of having modified and uh, updated the uh, controls and therefore definitely it goes a long way enhancing the security posture of the organization thank you for your answers okay so i now hand it over to dheeraj to explain about the journey way forward 
Thank you so much, Ravindra. And uh, uh, for the sake of uh, benefit of the participants who have any questions, we'll take the Q&A in just two minutes from now. So, uh, how can BSI partner with you? You can definitely purchase the uh, new standard 27002 from the BSI online site. Uh, we can conduct independent gap assessments, neutral gap assessments for your organization, and we can do a mapping of uh, how the new controls uh, can be mapped with the existing ones or uh, how the new controls can be implemented. And we can discuss around that with you. We can do instructor-led trainings for you in terms of giving awareness to your end users on the, some of the controls, and we can customize these trainings. We can do implementation level trainings for your core team of implementers who will be implementing the new controls. And last but not the least, uh, we can partner with you in your upgrade journey to the new 27001 because the new 27001, which is the requirement standard, auditable standard, certifiable standard, that will be released in October this year. So within now, uh, between April and October, is the time for you to gather that awareness on the new set of controls, which will be there as a mixture A in the 27001, and then upgrade your security posture or profile for your organization accordingly. Now, there's another question which uh, we wanted to uh, take up, and maybe you can give your responses. Would you like BSI to contact you for any or more of these services? So these are uh, information security controls training on the standard which you just uh, presented, or you want a uh, uh, ISMS based uh, training or certification on the 27001, the previous version, then uh, are you also interested in our privacy information system based training or certification or our cloud based training and certification? So you can select whichever options you want. So maybe we'll close it in 10 seconds. Yeah. Okay. So I think most of the people here are interested to know more about the 27002 training, which we've briefly uh, given an overview. And thanks so much for your responses. We'll get back to you. Uh, with a survey questionnaire in which you can put in your email, etc., or you can write to us also, and we will definitely address your queries. So that's a brief, uh, you can say, timeline into the next steps. Uh, between now and October, you can upgrade their ISMS based on the new controls, so you can get awareness on the new standard, start implementing the new controls as applicable. The 27001, which is the auditable standard, uh, revision expected in October 22. And for those who want to, uh, for those organizations who are interested in certification, we will come up with a transition plan after the uh, 27001 is amended in October. And uh, in the meantime, you can always take trainings from uh, BSI. Uh, with that, we will go to the Q&A. So I'll request my colleague Aprajita to have a look at the chat box. If there are any queries, we are welcome to, uh, we want to answer them right now. And if there are some queries which can be answered later, we'll do that later. Thanks. Over to you, Pradita. Thank you. Thank you, Dheeraj. I'm sure this was very insightful for our viewers. So we have received quite a few questions from our audience. We'll try to take them as many of them. I'm putting the questions in the chat box so everyone can see them. Okay, uh, the first one is addressed to you, Mr. Dheeraj. I have one query on my current organization, which is ISO 27002 to uh, 2013. Is it mandate to upgrade to 20, 2022 next year? Okay, so since you're mentioning about next year, you will have a transition timeline of at least two, three years, starting from October 22 this year, when the 27001 is revised, 
and that's the auditable standard and that becomes applicable for certification. My point is, so you will have ample time, at least two years, starting from October 22 to upgrade your organization wide certifiable ISMS. Hope that answers your question, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, isn't ISO 27002 and cloud secu uh, security expenses uh, is very expensive for SBMs? What is the option for them? Kindly advise. So if you're talking about the standard, the standard is not at all expensive in, uh, in terms of the organization expense. It's not. And uh, in terms of certification per se, maybe you can get in touch with the BSI advisor and they will be happy to give you a, a proposal for certification as well. And then you can decide accordingly. Yeah, also, I would like to add here is that for uh, SPMs, uh, we have a kind of a package where they can it's affordable and they can uh, also go for certification. So if you contact our BSI advisor, you will get a suitable uh, solution which for SPM also. Thank you. Uh, the next question would be. Just a second. Okay, now we have ISO 27002 standard by when we can have the new uh, ISO 27001 2020 standard ex expected to be released. Mr. Um, Davendra, would you like to be uh, yeah, answer yeah. that? It is October. Deeraj already mentioned in the presentation. We are expecting October as per the committee. It may come even earlier also. You will be notified once the standard is released. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is ISO 27701 is an extension of ISO 27001. Uh, is the new amendment uh, with the new amendment? What changes are expected to uh, expected in 27701? Mr. The, yeah, the change will answer? be similar to the controls which are changed in uh, 27001. So 27701 also will go for a change and it will be mapped with the controls which are updated in annexure A of 27001. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, if our organization is concentrating for ISO 27001 in October uh, 2022, for the first time, which standard will be applicable? Uh, it would be applicable, new, new version would be applicable. Okay, new, new version will be applicable and uh, you have a transition plan, but uh, it will be kind of, uh, uh, yeah, unproductive in terms of having a uh, old standard implemented and then going for an upgrade. Uh, uh, so if you go straight away for the new standard would be better. You still have a choice with the old standard, but put that time and effort to the new version. It will be more effective. Okay. Uh, next question is what controls to be considered during requirement gathering planning design con coding deployment monitoring iso 27002 uh, for that you have the uh, transition plan and steps for transition and uh, implementation while you contact our bsi advisor you will get a brochure with a whole lot of steps the steps will start with uh, procuring the standard understanding the controls undergo training cap assessment and uh, final certification is uh, what is being listed you will get all that information when you contact our bsi advisor Uh, I would also like to say is uh, somebody has written uh, in the chat box uh, is ISO 27002 is mandatory. 
ISO 27002 is a guide guideline for implementation. ISO 27001 is a auditable and uh, used for certification audits is a standard of ISO 27001. So 27002 is a guideline. It will help you how the controls to be implemented. And you can also use other controls. There was also mentioned that you can use other framework, NIST, COVID, CSA, CSA CCM, right? So uh, HIPAA information security controls can be used. Okay, thank you. Uh, we would be taking the last question for this webinar. Uh, Mr. Dheeraj, if you can answer how ISO 27002 different this time from S, uh, SOC2. Um, yeah. So uh, the SOC2 uh, is a different framework altogether, uh, primarily based for the US based geographies. This one, uh, ISO, as you know, is internationally acknowledged. More than 75% countries in the world have given a yes for it. So it is much broader framework. And uh, if your clients are based out of US particularly, uh, or are needing the SOC2 certification or audit, only then you should go for it. Otherwise, de facto, 27001 is the auditable standard uh, for information security, which is acknowledged worldwide. Thank you. Um, so I would like to thank you all and our speakers for joining us today.